Thank you very much. That's a piece called Monin by Bobby Timmons, pianist with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. The idea of moaning in African American music goes way back to the slaves who sang plaintively in their praise houses. Call and response, swinging rhythm, plaintive moaning, blues melodies, theme and variation. And when playing with other musicians, con conversations, live composition right before your ears. This is jazz. From New Orleans to Chicago to New York to Paris, Tokyo, Europe, and here in Wenham and Hamilton, jazz is among the most popular musics in the world. Why? What is so compelling about jazz? Well, it tells a story. Of course, all music tells a story, and there's a spiritual and cultural background to all music. The connection of music to spiritual life has been observed and expressed in many ways. Nietzsche once said, without music, life would be a mistake. And I, he added, could only believe in a God who knew how to dance. Or this from Mickey Hart, music has many sides. It can seduce or frighten you. It can rattle your bones. It can let you see God. Jazz was born in some unlikely places. We think of the brothels and the barrel houses of New Orleans, but in fact, jazz goes back much further. It comes out of the spiritual. Spirituals were sung by enslaved Africans in the midst of the hard oppression of chattel slavery. In the midst of this oppression, remarkable things happen, including evangelizing of large communities of slaves who embraced Jesus. One would not miss the irony here that they embraced the religion of their oppressors, though not their lifestyle. So the spirituals are at the origins of jazz, and these spirituals are about many different subjects. At the heart of them, though, is that the Lord would see them through, that God would look down and see His people through, that Jesus would walk with His people through the hardship. Walk with me, Lord.
Thank you very much. On a hot summer's day in 1845, the enslaved Africans were on their way to the secret meeting place far from the plantation. They carried with them buckets of water and several old sheets. After walking for miles in small groups of two or three, the first in the party could see the humble dwelling in the distance. Known as the hush house or the praise house, the structure was a simple log cabin. They entered and proceeded to hang the sheets up on the wall and douse them with water so that no one could hear. Before the last few slaves arrived, a preacher began to speak on Ezekiel and the dry bones. They're going to live again, he exclaimed. And he explained the new life in Jesus Christ to the gathering congregation. Soon the singing began. It followed the tones of the sermon and went on to soar into heavenly heights. One woman was wearing her apron with figures woven in of souls on their way up to heaven or down to hell. She remembers the scene vividly. The music began slowly, thoughtfully. Soon there was a call and response pattern. Now the group was not only singing but shouting the spiritual song. As the preacher went on, this slave woman remembered experiencing wonderful revival. With the message, then the song, she knew the Lord was alive despite her misery. And honey, she said, the Lord would come a-shining through them pages and revive this old slave's heart, and I'd jump up there and then holler and shout and sing and pat, and they would all catch the words, and they'd all take it up and keep at it and keep adding to it, and then it would be a spiritual. The spirituals were deeply comforting, but they were also about survival. Not only did they celebrate biblical characters and places, but they contained code words, a tradition that came over from Africa. These words instructed the slaves about strategy. For example, I'm on my way to Canaan land, of course, is about the hope of heaven. But it was also a signal on the Underground Railroad, a network of escape routes, to move north, far north, up to Canada, for which Canaan was a code word, where slavery was unlawful, particularly after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1857, and people lived free. Or wade in the water, children. Of course, it's about Joshua putting his foot in the Jordan by faith, and then it would open up. But it was also a warning to take the river route because the slave catcher was using bloodhounds to ferret out the escapees.
the spiritual should really be sung, but you do not want to hear me sing. Uh, serious changes in the atmosphere would occur. And, um, but um, this music is where jazz begins. Its roots are in the Negro spiritual. This extraordinarily powerful music is full of imagery and metaphor. Favorite events to sing about include the Exodus, the birth of Jesus, His death, and of course, the safe arrival in heaven. Heaven is a real place in the spirituals. It's got streets and gates. Blind Gary Davis sings, Twelve Gates Has the City, over and over. And if you get there before I do, the song continues, Tell my dear mother I'm on my way to meet, the, to meet her there. The favorite characters are Moses and Daniel and Joshua and, of course, Jesus himself. Oh, brothers, don't get weary. Oh, brothers, don't get weary. Oh, brothers, don't get weary. We're waiting for the Lord. We'll land on Canaan's shore. We'll meet forevermore. Now, black theology, particularly in the slave community, was not escapist. It was hopeful and deeply joyful. But heaven was not a foggy place far away that somehow something called the soul would ascend to. It's a real place. Meantime, we have a life full of trials. And sometimes it's right to pray as we are instructed by our Lord to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And He does that. But sometimes the Lord does not deliver us from evil by taking the trial away. He leaves it there in front of us like a mountain that won't be moved. Instead, He gives us strength to climb it, grace to go through the trial. Not many mountains were removed for enslaved Africans and even newly emancipated African Americans. Indeed, many race barriers still exist today like so many mountains. But nevertheless, because of the gospel, God gives remarkable strength to climb these mountains. So here is a James Wideman arrangement of, Lord, don't move that mountain.
you very much. Thank you. So much of life had to be led in secrecy. Often the words of both spirituals and blues were ironic, thinly veiling a critique of the lifestyle of the white oppressors. They could range from mockery to tragic lament. But new life came from the old structures. Or to put it technically, suppression was followed by reemergence. And there was often what I called last night good subversion going on. Here's a poignant example of that dynamic. Increasingly in the early 19th century, particularly in the South, a series of laws called Black Codes were enacted. These laws meant to curtail the activities and the freedoms of black people. In some cases, meeting others in a public place was forbidden. In some cases, dancing or singing were forbidden. Now, there's a place in New Orleans that you may know if you visited that wonderful but tragic city called Congo Square. It's been renamed Louis Armstrong National Park. And it wasn't ruined by the hurricane. It was a large space where blacks, both free and slaves, could come and enjoy some music and relaxation. They loved the drums, as the name implied, and when the singing and the dancing got going, well, it made quite a joyful noise. The town fathers got nervous about all this. They had read somewhere that dancing incites to riot. So they issued a black code pro prohibiting the dance on Congo Square. Now, this was a deep blow, yet not to be outdone, the black leadership sent a delegation to the town fathers and asked, so they could be sure and comply, exactly what is the dance? Well, they went into committee. I am not making this up. I'd love to have been there. Um, three days later, they came out of their committee with the following definition of dance. Dance is when you cross your feet. Okay. So, the black community said, fine, we will not do that. And they proceeded to create all kinds of extraordinary non-dance movements. <laughs> if you've ever seen a black choir march up to the altar, that's how, you, that's how they move. And they, they sing, carefully not crossing their feet. And watch a band during halftime. Um, this gave birth to a dance called the soul, the shout, which is actually from an Arabic word. And um, the shout uh, was a, a series of concentric circles, eventually became known as the ring shout. And um, this was a rite perhaps carried into North America from Africa, but it took on both a subversive and a religious meaning. It became this musical dance, uh, and black people who were Christians found biblical precedents for this, as in the occasions where the Israelites were known to dance before the tabernacle. The shout was associated with the biblical injunction to clap your hands and shout before the Lord. Now, this kind of renewal, this kind of good subversion is at the heart of African-American spirituality. Dealing with hard circumstances and overcoming them with grace and creativity is the direct fruit of the Christian faith of black people. In fact, this is repeated throughout history whenever believers from whatever background are persecuted. The Huguenots were mentioned earlier. Uh, they did similar things with the singing of the Psalms and writing little signals on the church bulletins about, um, you know, look out for the Nazis during the time of the occupation in, in France and, 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 and so forth. Um, not only was this in music, but often new ways were discovered because of persecution or through persecution to express life. Culinary arts, dress, hygiene, a lot of the Africans, enslaved Africans' medical arts were way ahead of the, the oppressive community of, of the whites. Um, and of course, worship was enhanced. Now, um, jazz comes from 
the spiritual. And uh, one of the lacks, I think, in the otherwise very great documentary uh, by Ken Burns called Jazz is the amount of, of underscoring of, of, of this. He, he got so many things right, but he, aside from a few odd pictures of praise houses, there wasn't much on this. But the spiritual was certainly not the only genre that fed in uh, to the central um, jazz form. Like so many rivers uh, that, that fe feed into a central stream, uh, there was the spiritual, uh, but there was also minstrelsy and marching bands and ragtime and, um, of course, most important, the blues. Now, it's impossible to understand jazz without understanding the blues. The blues grew out of work songs, and fascinating combinations occurred. Field hollers, sea chanties, work songs from many different groups combined to produce wonderful folk music on the cotton fields, the levees, the railroads. And eventually, a particular form crystallized. There were only three chords and only two lines, A, A, B. I hate to see that evening sun go down. Oh, I hate to see that evening sun go down. For my man, he has done left this town. really need our, our whole group up here um, next year. Uh, this is called the Hamlet of the Blues, composed by W.C. Handy. The St. Louis Blues 
He said he'd been inspired to write it by a chance meeting with a black woman on the streets of St. Louis, Missouri. She was distressed over her husband's absence, and she lamented to him, my man's got a heart like a rock cast in the sea, which is a key line of the song. Oh, that St. Louis woman with her diamond rings, she pulls my man around by her apron strings. And if it wasn't for the powder and her store-bought hair, oh, that man of mine wouldn't have gone nowhere. Now, this is songs of lost love. And you'd think it's a million miles away from the spiritual, but it's actually very close to the spiritual. It's musically very close. And most of the blues are much more than about lost love. There's a deeper kind of abandonment. White man, why did you bring me here to leave me in my misery? And behind that, as the great blues scholar Michael John Spencer comments, is theodicy. Where is God in all this? Is there a God? And indeed, some blues ask the question directly, others more indirectly. There's a great Robert Johnson blues called the preaching man's blues. Uh, some people have likened a, a blues singer to, to a preacher man. I like to liken the blues more to the laments and the wisdom literature in the Bible. Ecclesiastes is the greatest blues book of the Old Testament. Job is the finest blues singer of the Old Testament. And Hebrew poetry, not fortuitously, is based on the same parallelism as the blues. Or is it the other way around? So let me uh, draw this all to a close. These, sent, these rivers flow into this central stream called jazz. Somewhere at the very beginning of the 20th century, something like a miracle occurred, a marriage. And like all good marriages, the whole is richer than the sum of the parts. These forms all came together, and on the streets of New Orleans, and lots of wonderful history and background there, marching bands emerged that played spirituals, and they marched without crossing their feet, and they carried on, and they became um, a kind of a new form that the world had never quite seen, at least in its present, in its present um, exception before. It became known as jazz for reasons we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of speculation on where the word jazz comes from. Um, there was a singer in those times named Mr. Jazzbo Brown, but most of his, uh, musicians don't attest to his being at the origins. My favorite explanation, it's probably not right, but it's from the French, jazzé. Uh, which can mean to, to gossip and to move around, which is what people did when they were listening to the music. And you're, you're free to do that, I guess, uh, if it were up to me. But anyway, uh, yeah, how can you listen to jazz without moving around? The most, likely, um, the most likely origin is it's a racist sully. Um, when jazz first came into prominence, um, and when white people first heard it, uh, they were kind of shocked and surprised. It was very exotic. It was very different. It was like European music, but with a big difference. And so they called it jackass music. Now, if you take away the CK from the jackass, you get jazz, which was the actual first word uh, for, for jazz music. The important thing is not so much the etymology, uh, but is what jazz developed into. It was a music of swing, of call and response of the imitation of black singing style with instruments and melodic development. Jazz, more than anything else, back to the beginning, tells a story. Uh, there's a great tale uh, of the emergence of the extraordinary jazz trumpeter Roy Eldridge um, from the Midwest. And apparently when he was a young man, he was out playing and just uh, wowing the crowds. And, these two older gentlemen who were jazz musicians went to check him out. One of them had heard him before and the other hadn't. So they go and they, um, they sit down and they listen to the first set. And the older guy says to his friend, didn't I tell you how great he was? And the other, his friend says, yeah, this is the greatest technique I've ever heard. But he hasn't learned to tell a story. And then as the tale goes on, a couple years later, they go to check him out again and he has learned to tell the story. It's not just pure technique. Um, he's 
the form has, has married the content, if you will. And the, the, the form of jazz is all these different conventions, you know, blue notes and uh, kind of trading fours and all the things that we do in a band. But the content of jazz is what I like to call the, the narrative that moves from deep misery, deep sorrow, to inextinguishable joy. Uh, the sorrow of the experience of life on the plantation, but the, the, the joy of emancipation, very different from happiness. Joy means you've gone through the valley of the shadow of death, and then you're sitting at the banquet table on the other side. Happiness means you're taking a shortcut to the banquet table, and it's, it's okay to clap your hands and have fun, but it doesn't have roots. And I believe that at its best, jazz is this narrative from deep misery to inextinguishable joy. Perhaps the greatest exponent of jazz, although it's hard to call anything greatest in such a rich form, but one of the greatest is America's finest composer, who is Edward Kennedy, Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington grew up in the church. His mother read the Bible to him every day. He was steeped in the Christian faith, did not, um, like the rest of us, live an exemplary Christian life, uh, but he, was a, he loved the Lord and he trusted in His prov providence. And um, I think that's what we could say about the rest of us as well. Um, he had three goals for um, his music. He didn't like it to be called jazz. He felt that kind of pigeonholed it into some ethnic thing. Um, he accepted the term because that's what he had to play. Uh, he, he said in his autobiography, he looked forward to the day when there wouldn't be folk or rock or jazz or classical or ragtime. There'd only be two kinds of music, good music and the other kind. Well, anyway, he had three goals for his um, jazz music. One was to entertain. Entertainment is a marvelous Christian virtue, is it not? Uh, we're so distressed by the entertainment industry, which is based on hedonism, uh, but there's good entertainment. A another French word, entretenir, it comes from the idea of keep a conversation going with friends. And definition 12C in the great big Oxford Dictionary is maintain a conversation with eternity. Uh, entertainment at its best lifts you up from the grayness of life into something that's refreshing, much as the innkeeper would entertain the weary traveler. Second, the music should recount the story of African-American life. Duke, quoting Du Bois and many others, said, America has no meaning if it weren't for the blood and the sweat of African-Americans, and many other ethnic kinds as well. He was a very uh, cosmopolitan man. But he wanted people to know about the history. So he did long symphonic poems, starting with slavery, and, and then moving to the blues, and, and then uh, spirituals and, and, and then emancipation. And finally, it should honor God. All his life he wanted to do this, but particularly in the last decade of his life, Duke wrote three sacred concerts, which were kind of jazz oratorios, wonderful music. And um, at the heart of this, he wanted people to know that there was a God who cared for them. The first of these opens with a song called, In the Beginning, God, which is a poetic meditation on before there was the creation, before there was the fall, there was God. And Duke writes that, I wanted people to know that in their loneliness, in their babble, when they're reaching out to others but aren't sure they'll be heard, there is a God who began the whole thing, who is family, who is a dwelling place, and who listens. So his music all came together in these sacred suites. So I will conclude with uh, perhaps his most beautiful uh, gospel tune called Come Sunday, which has the refrain, look down, O Lord, and see your people through.
Thank you. Thank you.